So let's talk about some solutions. So we've talked a lot of, me and Mark have talked a lot about the problems. Let's talk about some of the solutions. So the first thing I just want to say, and if you've listened to this podcast for any amount of time, you will know that ownership is the first step in turning around your relationship. Yeah. And um, I won't go a, a lot into that, but if you want, just go back to some of Mark's podcast. He, he talks about living an ownership lifestyle, a lifestyle of ownership. And, um, and the way that I see that is just constantly asking yourself, um, what did I do to influence her negative behavior? Hmm. So like if we see a negative behavior in our wives and we think, oh, that's you, you, you. If you ask yourself the question, what did I do to influence that behavior? What did I do anything that would have influenced that behavior? And if you're honest, you cannot fix a marriage pro marriage without being brutally honest. When oh. you're honest with yourself, then you can answer those questions. What did I do in Flint? And you're going to find that most of the time her behavior was just a reflection of something you did that influenced her to do that. And again, I always say vice versa. Yeah. I, I just want to add this in here because like, this is so key. We've talked about this a lot in our group and in thrive. The idea, there's a difference between fault and responsibility. Fault is more about shame. Responsibility is about leadership. And what you're, what you're inciting here is, is leadership. What you're saying is like, how do I, be, how do I be accountable for my actions? And, and you're literally saying, I love how you use the word influence. You're not saying I caused her to cheat or I caused her to do this. No I one can make someone do something. Right. Exactly. But that's a lot of times men hear this and that's what they think we're saying. Like no one's saying that you caused your wife to cheat on you, but how did you influence? What kinds of behaviors did you do to influence her to have the response, the negative response or yelling at you or being toxic, et cetera. I know I triggered my ex-wife a lot and I gaslighted her. I stonewalled her. I did things because I emotionally wasn't mature and didn't know how to handle her immaturities and her things. And so it just became this toxic cycle over and over and over again. And once I put an end to that and put boundaries and all those things in, that's when it started to see, you could see the rift complete for me where it was like, oh my gosh, I'm doing this work. She didn't do the work and it is what it is, but I got my power. And in that power, I was able to have boundaries that are healthy for me. And that's what you're saying here is literally, it's about looking at your own stuff, ownership, and how did you influence? Cause every one of us did it. There's not one of us who are without sin. There's not one of us who are perfect. Right. We all do stuff that trigger our wife or have some sort of influence on the effect of what she does. And you, you had a key word, the, the word power. Because the moment you say, my wife pissed me off. Well, all that, all that saying is that I have no power in a situation. Yep. I'm powerless. When you say that, you're giving up all your power to her. Yep. And so you're doing exactly what you don't want to be done to yourself by saying that. Yep. But anyways, let, let's, uh, let's talk about some other more uh, practical um, steps. I think the high value man is a man that's selfless. Mm -hmm. And when I say the word selfless, I don't mean uh, disempowered selfless. Um, I believe there's a lot of empowerment in being selfless. So for instance, uh, what does a selfless husband look like? Um, asking myself where I went wrong before blaming my wife, doing things for my wife with zero expectations of reciprocity. Yep. I'll come back to that. Considering how it will affect my wife before I make a decision, right? She's my equal. Putting my wife's feelings above my own desires most of the time. Knowing my wife well enough to anticipate her desires. Listening to understand her first before trying to be understood. Mm. Um, being selfless is do what I'm asking her to do first before expecting her to do it. I call that the golden rule of marriage. Um, try to alleviate her stress before complaining about my stress. Here's a big one. 
validating her feelings before expressing my feelings. Mm. We could talk for an hour just on validation. I think oh, it's yeah. probably one of the greatest skills that you can learn as an empowered man. Um, doing things occasionally that she enjoys that maybe I don't enjoy. Apologizing for your part first, even though she was guilty too. So those are some things that that's what a selfless man looks like. But I want to put a warning on this. Don't be selfless just to get her to reciprocate. And Mark talks a lot about this throughout his program and through his podcast. The moment that you are trying to do things to, with the expectation, you know what expectations are. Uh, they're just uh, set up for resentment. Mm. You're just setting yourself up for resentment when you start place expectations on, on your wife. But if you're, if you're being selfless to get her to reciprocate, um, you're just setting yourself up for resentment and conflict in the marriage. You want to do it because you have enough love and self-respect for yourself that you want to become an empowered man. Mm. That's why you're doing these things. Take her out of the picture. Do you really want to be a prideful and selfish man? That's a weak man. That's the opposite of an empowered man. No, you're doing these things so that because you love and respect yourself enough that you want to be the best man you can be. You can bring your best foot forward in your marriage. So I'm just going to give a warning to you that your motivation behind being selfless is very important. If you're doing things for her, expecting reciprocity from her, then it's going to backfire on you. Wow. You, you want to say anything before I go on? No, I, no I'm just, I'm just eating at your table. Go ahead. Okay. Keep going. <laughs> so let's talk about, um, I'm into processes and systems. Yeah. All right. Um, Mark and I come, uh, come from the business world where processes and systems are what make or break a business. And there's this old saying that when you got a problem in your business and you don't have the results, um, look at your processes and systems before you look at your employees. Yeah. Because all you're doing is you're training an employee to follow your process and system. And, and that's the same in marriage. Before you look at your wife as the problem child, look at the system and process that you have going on in your marriage. I can tell you, if you have a great marriage, then you have some really positive systems and processes that are happening consistently in your marriage. If you got a crappy marriage, you've got some really bad systems and processes that are taking place in your marriage. And most of the time it has nothing to do with your companion. Yeah. It has more to do with the daily systems and process. So I want to just talk about, about that. First of all, acknowledge your own selfishness. That is the very beginning. We've already talked about this but I can't stress it enough. How about writing a letter to your wife, just recognizing how selfish you've been mm. and, and admitting to your wife, admitting to the hurt and pain that you've caused her, apologizing to her for that and never using the word, but never giving any type of, of uh, defense of why you, you did what you did. That's the first step. Guys, listen to me when I say this. Your wife wants to know that you know the pain and hurt you've caused her. I'm going to say it again. Your wives want to know that you know the pain and hurt that you're, you've caused your wife. Yep. That is cathartic for them. Yep. That alone will help to solve a lot of your problems. Remember, it, women with women, the problem isn't a problem. The problem is her feelings about the problem. <laughs> yeah. That's what the problem is. Yeah. Right. And so they want to know that, you know, that you've caused them a lot of pain and suffering and that you're admitting and owning up to that. Um, man, if you're, if you're in the tank and your marriage is holding on like a thread and you start to take ownership, <clears throat> this is one of the very first steps that you need to take. Yeah. Right. Okay. So that's the first thing. Second thing is you need to start working on your mindset. You need to, you, you have got some limiting and negative beliefs and stories that you're telling yourself that are causing you to do things. Remember your behavior always 
follow your beliefs. Okay. This is the model. If you talk to any life coach, they will tell you, this is the model. Beliefs drive your thoughts Mm -hmm. that drive your emotions that drive your behaviors that cause your results. Right. And so if you want to change behaviors, I could give you all the scripts in the world on things you can tell your wife that would just, you know, soothe her and calm her. But like, if you don't, you haven't changed your mindset and beliefs, then you'll always fall back to your old habits. Yep. So you've got to change your mindset. So let me just give you one little, I guess, tactic to help you to start reprogramming your mind. Um, I have this phrase and it goes like this. You before me equals we. Mm. You before me equals we. I like that. And I've memorized that phrase. And every time I'm kind of like challenged, I say to myself, you before me equals we. What is we? We is the relationship. And the only way the relationship can be successful is if you put you before me. Now, I'm not, I, now listen to me. All men need to have their outlet. They need to go out with their buddies sometimes. They need to go play basketball sometimes. They need to go exercise in the morning all the time. <laughs> okay. So I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about being a slave uh, to your wife. What, I, what I'm talking about is that putting her desires before yours, you before me equals we, is what creates successful relationships. So um, I have men... Uh, create this journal. I call it the better next time journal. And really it only, it only consists of uh, three questions. So every time you have an argument with your wife, you need to fit, make an entry into your better next time journal. The first question is what was the trigger that started the argument? Start identifying those things that are triggering you here. It's a better question. Why is it a trigger for me? What is causing, what belief or thought is causing this thing to be a trigger for me? And is it true? But here's the most important question. Number three, how could I have interpreted the trigger in a more positive way? What mindset shift could I have made that would have allowed me to interpret that trigger in a more positive way that would have allowed me not? to be triggered. That makes sense. Totally. I because, because, because in our, 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 our beliefs are what give meaning to circumstances. Yep. And then they become thoughts, which become emotions. And it all happens like that in our brain. Yeah. And that tactic you just gave is a beautiful example. Um, I, I'm sure you're familiar with the book, uh, slight edge, um, and it's all about the idea of getting 1% better. And that's really what you're talking about, right? It's, it's not like you have to make some drastic changes. You don't have to like just show up as some completely different husband tomorrow. It's those little things you do every day that help you become a more empowered man, a more empowered husband, more empowered father in general. And that was a, a great example of, uh, of doing that. Um, well, re- recognition, yeah. recognition is a big part of change. And so the more you can recognize your triggers, why they cause them. And if you could have interpreted them differently, just recognizing that you'll start to remember those things. The next time these situations come around. Yeah. And if you're, if you're a guy who's still figuring out how to journal, like meaning like you're not used to using pen and paper into like sitting down. um, I recommend doing something outside like work or like, like lawn mowing, something that allows your mind to be free. Personally, for me, what I do is I'll just go for a walk especially if I'm triggered on something and on that walk, I'll maybe listen to music or not. Uh, Maybe I'll pray or whatever. And I'll just like think through the situation and go, what kind of exactly almost the exact same questions you just brought is kind of what I'll, what I'll start with. And it's amazing what comes, what clarity will come to you. I had a thing where, you know, my wife had gotten mad at me about something and she kind of started giving me silent treatment. And that triggered me big time because I don't deal with stonewalling very well. Um, And I started to recognize that the reason I was upset was because I, I wanted to control her feelings and I wanted to make her give me an answer and she was shutting down. And that, that made me feel inadequate, insecure, all those things. And I was like, it's none of my business 
what she's feeling. I mean, obviously I'm, I'm only attentive to it, but, it, but whatever she's feeling, I don't have to control and I don't have to own. And so I was owning her feelings. I don't need to own her feelings versus like, because I just don't like people being mad at me. And, and, and it was like that rejection and all those things, just childhood trauma, just stuff from our past, whatever that we never deal with. And it really helped bring a lot of clarity to our relationship, especially early on. Um, and we haven't had that issue ever since, um, but just going for that walk and like, really like staying in the moment of like, what happened? Why is it like this? The questions you ask are beautiful. So I would recommend well, your, your last podcast episode. I think it was your last one was about the importance of the questions that you ask yeah. yourself. Yeah. Asking yourselves, how could I have interpreted that yeah. whole thing differently? Yep. Yep. Exactly. Well, David, um, I, I so appreciate you joining me today. Um, we are out of time, unfortunately got to run. Um, this has been phenomenal guys. We will drop uh, links uh, for David's uh, resources. He's got a book that he's just launching on Amazon as well as probably he'll probably have a landing page or something you guys can get connected with him on. Uh, I assume he's the squeeze page doctor and um, I'm sure he'll have one, one together, but this was fun. This was, uh, this was refreshing. Um, I, I love it. We, we normally don't get to talk about the actual context of marriage and, and from a functional standpoint. And here's a guy with 32 plus years of marriage experience, dropping some wisdom bombs on us and uh, guys take it to heart, go back and listen There's some deeper things. Um, I love it when we have these deeper conversations and it really makes you reflect. I'm reflecting on my own marriage and thinking through what are the things I'm doing or not doing and, and need to continue to get better at. None of us have it. None of none of us have all the answers. We all need each other in this, in this life. That's why men need men to come around them and encourage them. Um, you know, David's asking, David's offering us stuff. And before this, he was asking me questions and I'm giving him, you know, advice on things. That's what men do. Men sharpen men. Um, and that's why we have empowered men. Uh, look, if you're, if you're looking for what we do at a higher level, thrive is the program for you. It's uh, empoweredman.co slash book. Uh, you'll have a conversation with one of our advisors and, he can walk you through what your game plan is to get empowered and get your get yourself on that on that right path. But um, guys, that's it for today. We'll see you in the next one. Welcome to the Bourbon Moment. Join your host M Sizzle, J Dub, and Mandrew as they sip on some bourbon and spit some truth. Welcome to the Bourbon Moment. Why is it so hard for us to hit the me button? Uh, I don't think we're taught to do it, you yeah. know? Um, I mean, not, not to get like super grandiose here and, and like big, but I mean, look at like our country, our political system, look at, look at that stuff. Everything is about where, do, where do we make it about somebody else? Right. That um, even political parties, you know, it's always the other person, the other side, the other party. Um, and so I think division is kind of what we're taught culturally, um, radical accountability and ownership. I don't think is anything that we're really, um, schooled on at an early age. We're not really schooled on it culturally, socially. Um, I think that's changing. I think there's a revolution around that changing, but, um, we're, we're disconnected. We don't know how to reconnect, whether it's ourselves or other people or with our problems or what have you. But I mean, it's also like neurobiology, right? Like the brain's way of protecting itself. Yeah. So, um, I mean, there's a, there's a biological piece to it. And then there's like the psychological piece to it, the sociological piece to it, multifaceted. I, I like to look at it as as old as Adam and Eve, right? Adam sitting in the garden or Eve sitting in the garden, Adam, he's sitting in the garden and he, and he goes, God, God's asking him, Where, where'd you learn? He's like, it's the woman's fault. And ever since then, men have been blaming the woman. It's like, it's so much easier to go. It's her fault. I mean, look at her shaking her ass. That's the why I couldn't stay off of her. Why did you cheat? Why did you do this? Why did you do all these things? And it's like, it's so much easier just to blame other people, other situations. I like what you said there. It's like in our culture, in our society, it's everywhere. It's so prevalent. Like, political parties, you know, whatever. And so, and then, so if you've got the, the constant vision of that, seeing your president or seeing or whoever doing that, it doesn't matter. Again, it doesn't matter even what side, right? They're all doing it. And then you have yeah. the biological and psychological nature of it. Then you have media that portrays it and you have TikTok, right? It's like, like nobody wants to take ownership. So then we come with this message of ownership and they're like, what the fuck did he just say? 
it's my fault that my wife, no, I didn't say it's your fault. You're responsible for what happens in your marriage. And that's a, that's a dichotomy. We talk about shame. I look at fault as shame and responsibility as leadership. What do you think about that? Fault is shame and responsibility is leadership. Yeah. So the idea that if I'm saying it's your fault, what I'm doing is I'm basically shaming you in a sense. But if I'm saying it's your responsibility, it's more about leadership and how are you going to own your shit essentially? Because that's all you can do. You can't own what she does. You can't own how she showed up or any of those things. The only thing you can do is look at you. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think some people kind of, they kind of get pissed off when they hear that in a program or in therapy or in coaching, like, what about you? But, um, the truth is, is that if you're focused on the other person and blaming somebody else, even if they did do something in the wrong, like people don't get sometimes that doing that just perpetuates your own suffering. So, so Mm. what, like, okay, you get to blame them. Yeah. So what happens when you get to blame them? They're like, well, I get to be angry. Great. You get to be angry. Is that really how you want to spend the next 24 hours a day, seven days a week is pissed off as hell? Like That's good. you get to if you want to, but there's also like tons of other stuff like joy and gratitude and excitement and sadness and grief and um, uncertainty and um, like peace, contentment. Like there's so many other things that you could occupy too. Like we just perpetuate our own suffering when we look at the other person. But you were talking about like men wanting to blame and you know, I've, I've worked in women's programs, men's programs, and then do couples work like all at the same time. So I literally get to see like the whole picture and women do it too. Women love yeah. to blame men. Yeah. Like, and, and sometimes it's really natural. Like I do it too. And I'm trained, like n- something that happens is definitely my husband's fault. Like <laughs> I, I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't want that to be true, but it's like where the brain goes because yeah. If you think about it, it's like, well, what, what an emotion is, is this giving me permission to have? Mm-hmm. And, and for a lot of people, maybe they had never had permission to actually have certain emotions, you know, like I think about like little kids, you know, they, they fall and they scrape their knee and it's bleeding or maybe it's not, maybe it's just a scrape and they're like, ah, having a meltdown and a parent goes and picks them up and says, shoo, 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 you're okay. Look, you're fine. It's not even bleeding. Look, it's not, it's not that big of a deal. You, you don't even need a Band-Aid. Or they go the opposite direction and they're, <laughs> do we need to call the ambulance? Do you need to go to the ER? Do I need to call a doctor? <laughs> you know, and the, meanwhile, the kid doesn't feel any better. But like we're taught at early ages, like your big feelings, your big reactions, like can you just like make them a little more digestible or containable for me? Because it's a lot. Yeah. So, yeah, so I, it's like we're not equipped ourselves as parents to to deal with or sit with those emotions and so it's like we want to quickly i I know i'm that way with my kids they start getting loud like shut the fuck up i can't handle this right it's like you especially as a younger parent i remember when i was a younger parent oh my god i was horrible it was like constantly anytime they felt something i'm like stop screaming you know it's like i can't handle this but like as you get older you start to see hey some of that is just healthy like they just need their you know their stuff or it's like so now I'm like, hey, if you're going to have those emotions, that's cool. Go have them outside. So that way it's nice and big out there and not inside the house. Yeah. So there's some, some balance, I guess. But even then, there's like a story we're telling ourselves, right? Yeah. Like if the kid's having a meltdown or the wife is like super pissed off at me, there's some story I'm telling myself about that. Yes. Yes. And maybe I'm not equipped as a parent. I'm failing. I don't know what to do. They won't listen to me. I have shitty kids. Um, my wife you know, um, can't stand me. Um, nothing I do is good enough. I'm a failure. Um, I'm just here for a paycheck. Like these are all stories we tell ourselves when that kind the of one, stuff. Comes up. The one you just said about, you know, with the wife or whatever, I, I remember last year, um, there was, there was an issue that came up with, with my wife and I, and she'd gotten upset with me and I immediately felt that, that, that trigger freeze where it was like my trigger went into freeze mode. You know, a lot of times fight or flight or freeze. And I froze and it was like, I had this, this thing and it just came up and I'm like, I've got to go process this. And I remember going on the process and it was like, I found myself coming to this place of, it's not okay for her to be angry with me. And I didn't say that, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't vent it, I wasn't mad, you know what I mean? But it was like, there was something in me that was saying that. I'm like, where is that coming from? 
And, you know, you talk about childhood work and, and, and some of those things. And it was like seeing that that was essentially, you know, some stuff from my dad. And I don't want to get into all the wounding of it, but it was like, I had created this thing. And even in my last marriage where it wasn't okay for that person to say or be upset or any of those things. And then I took that unresolved issue of stonewalling, et cetera, bringing that into current relationship and started to feel that whenever things would escalate or things would start to feel unsafe. Mm-hmm. And it's a, it's a hard thing to deal with. But like, I think that's the thing is you have to be uh, available to your own emotions. Oh yeah. You know, it's like, and if you're not available to your emotions and this is the stuff that men, like this is the stuff we talk about at Thrive, right? This is the stuff that it's like the real shit when it comes down to it, because this affects every area of your life. And, and so it doesn't matter who you are. I mean, Misty was admitting a minute ago, Joey has plenty of shit. We all know that. Andrew has plenty of shit. Like we all have shit. It really comes back to awareness of those things. And, and then not just awareness of the thing, like from CBT, but like actually having a plan and doing something about it. So that's all I got on that. Bottoms up. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers on that. Thanks for joining us on the Bourbon Moment. This is your host, M. Sizzle. I've got Mandrew and I got J Dub. And we are out. We'll see you next week. <laughs>